everybody. Welcome to Transforming Oral Histories, Harnessing the Power of Chicago's Japanese American Voices. My name is Emma Saito Lincoln, and I'm the Legacy Center Director for the Japanese American Service Committee in Chicago, Illinois. Before we get started, I'd like to thank the organizers of both Tadaima 2021 and Journey Chicago for including tonight's program in their schedules. We're honored to be included in both, and I hope that no matter how you found out about tonight's talk, you'll leave feeling excited about JASC's new digital exhibits and our efforts to activate the archives. Just so you know what to expect over the next hour or so, uh, first, I'll be giving you a very brief overview of the larger project that enabled us to create the exhibits that we'll be focusing on tonight. Then I'll hand things over to Catherine Nagasawa, who is the real mastermind behind Uprooted and Reckoning. Kat is a former digital producer at WBEZ, which is Chicago's NPR affiliate station. And she's currently working as a digital producer for Full Spectrum Films, which is a Chicago-based nonprofit committed to driving equity in the independent film industry and educating the public about important social and cultural issues. After Kat has finished, I'll sum up briefly with some information about the TEACH Act that was passed recently in Illinois. There will be time for some Q&A at the end, so please feel free to type your questions into the chat and we'll address as many as we can. So let's start at the beginning. How did this project come into existence? In 2018, the Japanese American Service Committee had the extreme good fortune of receiving a grant from the National Park Service under their Japanese American Confinement Sites program. This grant funded a collaborative project between my organization, JASC, and the Chicago Japanese American Historical Society, CJAHS. For those who aren't familiar with the NPS JAKS grant program, these funds are made available for projects that further the preservation or interpretation of US sites where Japanese Americans were incarcerated during World War II you may be wondering why organizations in Chicago received a grant when there were no incarceration camps here. And to understand that, you have to know that Chicago became a major resettlement hub as people were released from the camps and starting their lives over. Uh, with the population swelling to approximately 20,000 people in the post-war years versus less than 400 people of Japanese descent in Chicago prior to the war. To this day, the Japanese American community in Chicago has roots throughout the West Coast military exclusion zone and reflects experiences at all of the former incarceration sites. Uh, next slide. There were many aspects of the grant project that we will not have time to go into tonight, but to give you some sense of the scope, I've listed out the key goals on this slide. On the oral history side, it encompassed digitization of pre-existing recordings, transcription, recording a substantial number of new interviews, and making content more accessible online. Additionally, the grant funded the two digital exhibits that Kat will be talking about, as well as curriculum development and teacher training workshops to enhance teachers' ability to incorporate this history into their classrooms. I do want to take a moment here to acknowledge the incredible work of our grant collaborators at the Chicago Japanese American Historical Society. In particular, Jean Mishima and Marlin Nishimura, who put countless hours into developing a comprehensive curriculum on Japanese American history. Despite the challenges of the pandemic, they were able to pivot from the original workshop plan and delivered two virtual teacher trainings this spring that were very well received by an audience of more than 50 teachers. Next slide, please. To provide a little more detail about JASC's oral history project, it's important to note that the interviews recorded as part of this grant were actually a continuation of a project that began in 2017. The interviews began under the direction of Anna Takada in conjunction with an exhibit called Then They Came For Me, which was held at the Alphawood Gallery here in Chicago. In 2018, Anna and the Oral History Project moved from Alphawood to JASC, and the grant we're discussing now began that summer, so summer of 2018. Altogether, interviews with over 100 inter uh, individuals were recorded between 2017 and 2021. And if you're not familiar with the terms Nisei, Sansei, and Yonsei, those are the Japanese language terms for second, third, and fourth generation. As with so many things, 
We owe a debt of gratitude to our partners at CJAHS for helping Anna identify potential interviewees and should also note that her work was, of course, informed by the earlier Regenerations Oral History Project led by the Japanese American National Museum with CJAHS as their regional partner in Chicago. The Chicago Regenerations team included Jean Mishima, uh, Mary Doi, Alice Murata, and others and their work from the late 1990s sets a very high bar for those of us working in the oral history arena today. And with that, I'll hand things over to Kat to explain how she navigated from raw oral history interviews to the incredible multimedia sites she has produced for us. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emma, for giving that context on the oral history project. Um, so today I'm going to go into depth about the process behind developing Uprooted and Reckoning, which were the two interactive websites um, that I built as part of that larger grant. Um, so for Uprooted, it was to build upon the oral history project that Anna had um, started and develop an online exhibit that teaches Japanese American uh, World War II incarceration history, as well as resettlement to Chicago. And sort of the two guiding questions for this exhibit that we hope to answer were, you know, how did the experience impact people's identities? Not just their personal identities, but also um, on their family members, their kids, grandkids, great grandkids. And then also what can we learn from this story about larger issues of racism, immigration, um, civil rights? Um, we wanted to make sure that history was taught in a way so that students could make um, larger connections between incarceration history and um, current issues. Um, next slide, please. So we started with our um, key audience. Um, I have a background in journalism, and so does our web developer, um, Paula Friedrich. And a lot of times when we're reporting a story, we ask ourselves, you know, who is the intended audience for this story? And uh, for this particular project, that audience is Chicago history teachers. We really wanted to start the process by going to them with some questions about how they taught history, when students are most engaged in history, and then also some practical considerations um, around uh, classroom usage that would help inform the experience. Um, so we um, put out a Google form survey to Chicago area teachers and conducted some in-depth structured phone interviews with several of them, um, making sure that we had geographic diversity from all parts of the city as well as the suburbs. Um, some of the questions that we asked were around their teaching approach for history. So. What are the main uh, teaching tools do you use? Uh, which ones have been most effective in your classroom? Uh, when are students most bored in your class? And when do they seem most engaged? Um, and then also, you know, have you used personal narratives or oral histories in your classroom before? And if so, you know, what examples can you provide and what format did you use to teach them? Um, we also asked some technical questions around, you know, if you're using multimedia or a web experience in the classroom, uh, what parts uh, work really well, and then also what parts are annoying or, or difficult to use. Um, and again, you know, as I mentioned, some of those practical constraints, we had to ask people, on average, how much time would you be willing to dedicate uh, realistically to World War II incarceration in your classroom? And also, what kind of technology resources do students have access to? With the pandemic, though, you know, digital access became much more widespread, and so access to Wi-Fi and laptops was less of a concern. Um, if you go to the next page, um, you know, some of the insights from those interviews, uh, firstly, in CPS, which stands for Chicago Public Schools, U.S. history is generally taught during the junior year of school, and there actually is no standardized U.S. history curriculum. So everyone can create their own curriculum based on what um, they want to teach or what textbook their school uses. Additionally, all CPS schools should have Wi-Fi connection and laptop carts accessible for teachers to um, borrow out for their classes. Um, in terms of time frame, most classes are around 50 minutes long, so anything we designed would have to fall within that 40 to 45 minute range to give teachers a little buffer on each end. Um, and then as for teaching responses, um, overall the themes that came through in the interviews were that students respond best to personal narratives, um, especially if it's from somebody who's around their age and is very relatable to them. Um, multimedia was also a huge plus. Students enjoy interacting with different mediums, whether that's audio, photo, video, et cetera. 
And then something that was really interesting to me was um, one teacher who said choice-based experiences was something that he noticed Gen Zers really enjoyed. Um, the quote that he said was, the more agency the kids have, the more bought in they'll be. Gave some examples about how kids can customize their Nike shoes these days, their shampoo. And so anything that has that sort of choose your own adventure type approach um, was very engaging for younger students. Um, another quote I wanted to highlight that I think any teachers in the audience would relate to is the less the teachers have to do, the more likely it is they'll use it. Um, so trying to make the experience as frictionless as possible um, and not having the teachers do any extra work to find information um, on the website. Um, so with that in mind, you know, we had a better sense of what we needed to create. It had to be a 40 to 45 minute long experience. And then any supplemental materials had to be flexible in terms of the time needed. Um, so think about it like an accordion. You can scale it up or down based on how much time you have. Um, obviously something that's very ready made and easy to use as well as functional across um, laptop, tablet and, um, and phones. On our end, some considerations were uh, production time for you know, a small but mighty team, and then also uh, the interest and availability of community members to participate as subjects. Um, I also wanted to highlight a couple pieces that inspired us as we were thinking through format um, and might be also useful to others who are working on oral history adaptations. Um, this example is from the Illinois Holocaust Museum. They did a hologram project where they flew 22 Holocaust survivors to a studio in LA that captured them with 360 degree, degree cameras answering, I think it was more than a thousand questions. And how that translated to the stage was that uh, students would actually see um, the Holocaust survivor beamed onto the stage in 3D and are, were able to ask them questions almost in an Amazon Alexa or Google Home way and that person would respond. And because they had recorded such a large database of questions and answers, it was fairly likely that a question you asked would be um, within that database. And I think the, the really um, shining part about this uh, approach to teaching history is just how conversational and interactive they made history, especially given that a lot of Holocaust survivors are passing away. Um, having a hologram exhibit is a way to still make that history feel alive and very present. Um, the next example is called Under Our Skin. It's a project on race by the Seattle Times. I think what we really loved about this example is just the element of choice. So there is no linear way to go through the website. You actually get to choose um, which issues you wanna learn more about, whether that's institutional racism or uh, microaggressions, and you get a custom experience based around that. And the next uh, site I wanted to highlight is called Hyphen Nation. It's a project by POV and New York Times. I think what this does well is getting people to talk um, in very emotional ways about their identities and using um, hand-drawn visuals as a way to complement those stories. And that's something that we really took inspiration from, having hand-drawn elements, having illustrated elements um, integrated with video and photo. And finally, um, The Orange Story, which is um, produced by my new employer, Full Spectrum Features. Um, the Orange Story follows um, a Japanese American man who owns a business as he's preparing to um, leave his home you know, after this, uh, the signing of his executive order 9066. And I think um, The Orange Story has a web companion to the, to the short film. And it does a really good job of integrating educational elements throughout the entire site. So um, when Full Spectrum was developing this website, they were um, intending it for classroom use. So it was a great example for us as to, um, you know, how other places are thinking about um, integrating multimedia with, um, with classrooms. So based on our research and those pieces of inspiration, uh, we came up with three different approaches for our website. Um, the first is option A, which I call the oral history medley. I would say this is probably the most like your traditional textbook. Um, you hear multiple different voices that highlight diversity of experience. And there's only one kind of way to navigate the website. Everybody gets the, the same kind of experience. And this is good, I think, for sort of a big picture history overview. 
Um, the next option is following a specific character family. And this is um, where we really tried to incorporate that element of choice that one of those history teachers mentioned was um, really appealing. And in this one, you are able to um, choose a family to follow and get a customized experience um, centered around that particular family. And, um, you know, there's that element of choice. And then also we hope that the students would have a deeper connection to that particular family um, by you know, getting to know them well and following them from the West Coast all the way to Chicago. And then option C um, is very similar to option B, but it adds in one extra layer, which is the ability to interview a character or family member. And so um, there will be multiple questions that you can choose from, and you're able to queue up different videos based on those choices. So whereas options A or B might have videos interspersed throughout that all viewers watch, um, option C gives people the choice of which ones they want to consume um, and in what order. Um, so what did we land on? We chose option C, where um, it's all based around a particular family and um, it has that ask question feature in the videos. I think the pros of this, uh, this approach is being able to, like I said, develop a deeper connection with a particular family and having those multiple levels of uh, choice and interactivity built in. I think one of the cons is, you know, not getting the breadth of experience that you would in an option A. Um, but given the time constraints, we felt that um, it might be best to go narrow and deep first and hope that students are really engaged with these families and that leads them to um, exploring the larger oral history collection from JSC and CJAHS. Um, one, of the one other thing we were worried about with this format was, um, you know, if we're focusing so much on family stories, will we um, not get that historical context that's really important for learning World War II history? And so how we tried to solve that was really being intentional about weaving the historical context into all of the family stories, and then also using key terms and supplemental resources as a way to um, expand on any gaps that we had. Um, the next step in our process was um, selecting families to participate. And this is where I relied really heavily on Anna Takata, who is the oral history project lead. Um, she had experience interviewing literally dozens of older Japanese Americans in Chicago over the course of multiple years. And so she had thought a lot about, you know, persistent themes that came up, things that would feel representative of, you know, that breadth of community experience, since we weren't going to be able to do that um, in this approach. Um, Ultimately, that led us to three individuals, um, Minoru Imamura, Chiyoko Omachi, and Kazuo Ideno. And Anna chose them based on a couple factors. You know, some of them were age at the time of incarceration, uh, gender, also um, comfort level with speaking, and um, interest in sharing their story uh, more broadly in a public sense. Um, and she also was thinking about some core themes. So for Minoru Imamura, um, the theme that she felt his story really captured well was military service during World War II. Um, he was part of um, an army, an army unit that practiced with, uh, that trained with the 442nd. Although he did not end up serving in the 442nd, he trained as um, a replacement for the 442nd. And he also, his story also really hits on the very controversial loyalty questionnaire that was administered in camp. Um, Chiyoko Omachi, um, her story really represents the experience of somebody who left um, camp early for student leave. Um, this is an early leave clearance that was granted to uh, younger Japanese Americans to complete high school and college in the Midwest and on the East Coast. And then Kazuo Ideno, um, his family experienced um, family separation when his dad was taken to a Department of Justice camp um, because he was a kendo instructor in um, San Francisco's Japantown. Um, Kaz's story also touches on the resettlement community on the south side of Chicago. Um, his family ran a Japanese American boarding house. Um, so these are the surface level themes, but as I had um, time to get to know all of these individuals, there became underlying themes that, um, that kind of came through the cracks. And I hope that these themes also come through in the final stories. Um, for Min, you know, that would be using pilgrimage to the former uh, camps that he was incarcerated at as a form of remembrance and healing for his family. For Chiyoko, that would be using um, 
you know, her voice and also the written word um, to tell other people about the Japanese American story and fight to protect civil liberties of other communities. And then for Kazuo, there was a lot of loss of Japanese uh, language and culture that he experienced due to the intense pressure he felt to assimilate uh, once he was in Chicago. And this was all a result of that incarceration and resettlement experience. Um, so once we had our three main subjects, um, I was mapping out the stories um, using those oral history recordings that Anna had done. So um, she had done very long, extensive oral histories with each of those grandparents. And that helped me in forming a timeline of their lives and also a thematic map for uh, follow-up questions or things that we could explore further. Um, and the way that I divided up the, the stories is into five chapters where the first three chapters really focus heavily on the grandparents' experience um, living on the West Coast before World War II, um, their experience with forced removal and incarceration, and then their resettlement to Chicago. And then chapter four and five would focus more on the children's and grandchildren's experience for growing up in Chicago. Um, the fun part was next, um, conducting video interviews and spending time with all of these families. Um, because of the specific format we were doing with the question and answers, um, I re-recorded video interviews and used a green screen um, and had each of the subjects talk directly to the camera. And the, the thought behind this is to um, make it as immersive as possible and as conversational as possible. So when you see the final videos, it should look as if each person is talking directly to you from within the web page. Um, so these are the Edenos. Um, I actually didn't include every family member that I interviewed in the final piece, but every interview I did was really instrumental in giving me a sense of the family story. And um, the interviews that were not included in the final piece will still be part of that larger oral history collection that will be available online. So those are the Edenos. Uh, second family is the Imamuras with Min in the middle, um, his two daughters, Carrie and Gail, on top, and then two granddaughters, Annika and Kara, along the bottom. And last but not least, the Omachis, uh, Chiyoko on the left, Teresa in the middle, and Chris, the grandson, on the right. And uh, one other thing to note about these um, these video interviews, you know, it's not like a traditional oral history where we're capturing their entire life. Um, a lot of the focus of these video interviews was very specifically trying to get at some of the themes that you know I had mapped out in those um, the slide with the chapters. And so in these interviews, I tried to focus more on the emotional experience of incarceration and resettlement as opposed to getting all of the details because um, my thought was that we could accomplish some of the details and information in the tech, the story text, um, but the videos would be the most effective medium for conveying anything that um, is related to an emotional experience. Um, another element to the um, the process of producing this was gathering a lot of personal um, family archival photos um, from each of the families and pairing that with historical photos that gave a little bit more of that context. Um, so here's an example from Chiyoko's story. Um, she has this beautiful family photo of her dad who worked um, in a Japanese shipbuilding um, facility on Terminal Island on the left. And then on the right, you see a historical photo of the FBI roundup on Terminal Island after um, Executive Order 9066 was um, signed. Um, another example comes from Kaz's story. There's a really cute photo of him and his younger brother, sumo wrestling at Crystal City, um, which is a Department of Justice detention camp in Texas. And on the right, you see a historical photo showing an aerial view of that same camp. And um, Thirdly, uh, this is Min and a couple of his friends um, at Camp Amachi, located in Granada, Colorado. And on the right, you see um, a larger wide photo of the rows of barracks at that camp. And I think um, this pairing really helps place Min, Chioko, and Kaz uh, within the historical context while still maintaining the fact that this is a personal story. Um, but I think that, um, you know, that personal element was really important to keep as a through line throughout. And um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Building on that, you know, I think that the personal photos that we did collect are irreplaceable and um, do a really great job of um, making students really feel like, you know, this is somebody's childhood or this is somebody's life. This is not just a, 
a textbook or something that's abstract. Um, you know, here are some photos from Kaz's childhood in Chicago. On the left is his mom and a couple of the um, boarders from their boarding house, just hanging out on the shore of Lake Michigan in Jackson Park. On the right is Kaz and his baseball team, which uh, mostly consists of other Japanese American teens who resettled to Chicago. Um, later on in Kaz's life, he studied to become a teacher at University of Illinois at Chicago. So on the left, you see him with his classmates. And then on the right, you see his daughter, Karen, growing up in the suburbs, celebrating her birthday. And finally, um, Kaz's grandson, Ryan, grows up going to the Obon Festival with his grandpa in Chicago. And on the right, you see the two of them volunteering at the Ginza Festival, which happens every summer at Midwest Buddhist Temple. Um, so these all just add so much more depth and um, you know, dimension to the stories, being able to um, see Kaz grow over a lifetime and then also get to meet his family. Another element of um, producing this piece uh, was developing a visual identity for it. And we had the um, great privilege of being able to hire an illustrator um, to actually help us with illustrations and artwork for this project. Um, so we worked with Cori Nakamura Lin. Uh, she's a Taiwanese Japanese American um, artist who grew up in Chicago. And her story actually um, mirrors a lot of the stories that um, we focus on for Uprooted. Um, her family resettled to Chicago after World War II and her grandpa was actually incarcerated at the same camp as Min. They actually knew each other. So I think for her, this project was very personally meaningful and she brought a lot of her own lens and her own family experience to conversations around visuals, which I think made them so much stronger. Um, so some questions that we were considering um, in the early conversations around visual identity is, you know, just how can visuals help us really reinforce some of those main themes we want students to take away? Um, and also how can visuals convey parts of stories that we don't have photos for, where we have gaps in visuals for? I think after discussing this, um, Corey landed on uh, visuals that were Japanese inspired, um, colorful, very hand drawn and textured. Um, so here are a couple examples um, for each of the characters of sort of visual motifs that we came up with. Um, for Min, you know, broccoli fields, he uh, left a broccoli farm in Anaheim um, when he was going to camp, uh, military gear for his service uh, during World War II, and then floral arrangements. He was a florist in Chicago um, after he resettled. Uh, for Chiyoko, you know, she grew up on Terminal Island, so um, there was a lot of visuals around surfboards, the ocean. Um, she also uh, was a journalist and also a storyteller, so sheets of paper to represent her interest in writing. Um, and then Kazuo, you know, a lot of his story focused around um, how incarceration changed his relationship to Japanese culture, whether that be kendo or calligraphy. And so we were um, kind of playing around with the concepts of barbed wire and um, different cultural elements. Um, so here's an example for how um, Corey translated some of these ideas into actual visuals for Chiyoko's story. Um, she did a beautiful portrait of her based on a photo, and then she um, pulled these themes of ocean, writing, civil liberties into um, small illustrations that are featured throughout the story. And what I love about these is that um, she really pulls from specific details. So Chiyoko talks about how her dad made her a little surfboard that she would ride um, on the beaches of Terminal Island. And on the top right, you do see a little Chiyoko with her surfboard. You know, So that's not something we have a photo of, but um, Corey did such a good job of visually representing it in her illustrations. And um, on the landing pages for each of the character stories, we feature that portrait along with a quote that really sort of captures um, the main theme and takeaway of that particular person's story. Um, so for Chiyoko, that would be, um, we have to do everything we can to fight for the civil liberties of others. And that starts with telling our story. And this quote is something that we workshopped directly with her um, and made sure that it felt like something that really embodied um, the message she wanted to share. And then finally, Corey also designed these um, gorgeous chapter headings that help set the stage for each of the different chapters of Chiyoko's life. Um, so if you look at the top left, you know, she's leaving her home in Terminal Harbor or Terminal Island in California. Um, in chapter two at the top, she arrives in Poston and um, ends up starting a student newspaper to report on teen life and camp. 
Um, on the right, she actually takes early leave to finish high school on the East Coast and gets in an argument with her principal about whether she is black or white. And she consistently pushes back, I'm neither, I'm Asian, um, which I think really represents, I think, her personality and her persistence um, that's a through line in her life. Um, and then in the bottom, um, you see her passing along a civil rights book to her daughter. This is the chapter that really focuses on Teresa, her daughter's story, and Teresa's experience as a lawyer, uh, focusing on constitutional law, which is inspired by her mom's work. And then finally, at the bottom left, you see Chioko speaking to the middle school of her um, granddaughter or grandson, um, Chris, and his, ex his experience um, seeing his grandma share her story. Um, something else I wanted to highlight um, before I demo the site is just how we were thinking about building in educational elements um, and providing some of that context that I mentioned earlier. Um, so so uh, one way we did that was through key terms and definitions. So if you hover over certain terms, um, it'll actually show you a definition. Um, and then also for each of the character stories, we have a tab called classroom resources that include supplemental readings and viewings based around the themes for each of the, um, the, the families. And so for Kazuo, um, a lot of the supplemental resources uh, focus around the WRA's resettlement process. Um, for Chiyoko's, um, a lot of it focuses around the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 and the redress movement. And then for Min's story, um, the supplemental materials focus on the loyalty questionnaire and um, different um, aspects of military service during World War II, whether that's the 442nd, um, draft resistors, or uh, the no-no boys. In addition to this, oh, if you go back one slide, um, we also held those two teacher training workshops um, this past spring that feature the larger um, CJAHS curriculum, which includes a chapter on Uprooted. Um, and this was led by Jean Mishima and Marlene Nishimura. And this actually goes much broader than the scope of Uprooted. It starts with the roots of anti-Asian legislation um, pre-World War II, and then it goes all the way to the present, making connections. Um, and so Uprooted is intended to sort of fit as a middle chapter of that larger curriculum. Um, so finally, putting it all together, um, we're going to do a quick walkthrough of the site. I think Emma might also link to the site in the chat so people can uh, peruse at their leisure. Um, just a heads up that you know both of the sites I'm showing you today are still in demo form. Um, they're not fully formed. There's still elements that are missing. So please forgive us if there are glitches or um, certain things that aren't fully complete. Uh, but if you want to just click begin, um, there is an introduction where you get to meet those three individuals, learn a little bit about Executive Order 9066 and the forced removal, and then learn about resettlement to Chicago and actually get to see the family members that you can explore. So once you click Follow Family, it takes you to the Choose page, and this is where um, students are able to pick which family member they want to follow. Um, it also includes a little bit of a tease of what the stories are about, as well as the ability to quote unquote meet their families. If you click on that button, um, you get to see each family member and learn a little bit more about which generation they are. And um, if you click Read Chioko's Story, um, I'll just do a really brief walkthrough here. You see that um, beautiful landing page that Corey designed. And then you start at that first chapter where Chioko is living on Terminal Island as a teenager and World War II starts. Um, so it's a combination of her family photos, discussion questions, key terms, historical photos. And at the very end of each chapter is where you have the ask feature. And so Chioko looks like she's kind of waiting for you to ask her a question. So students can choose between those different questions. Maybe we'll do um, what was it like growing up on Terminal Island and you can hear from her. Well, it was just the beach and uh, uh, the roaring of the sea, you know. And at night, you could, on moonlit nights, it was very romantic, I think. Um, and we would sit up there and sing songs. <laughs> um, a very, uh, a very lovely childhood, I think. It's too bad, you know, we couldn't have grown up there. It was disrupted and we had to leave because of the war 
but I, uh, I often think, I go back to those days and I think that was a very lovely place to be, you know. Cool, and then she goes back to waiting for you to ask the next, the next question. Um, and then as you go through the full story, you know, chapter two and three focuses on Chiyoko and then chapters four and five focus on her daughter, Teresa, and her grandson, Chris. Um, so I know we don't have a ton of time, so um, I'll let you all explore this um, at your own leisure later on. Um, but that's a little preview of it. Um, next, I am going to talk about the process for developing Reckoning, which was the second um, web experience that was part of that larger oral history grant. Oh, I know it's tricky to get back in after present mode. I think if you go to the slide before that, awesome. Okay. Um, so uh, for this particular exhibit, you know, it was a pretty similar goal. It's a teaching tool, um, but focusing on the Chicago Japanese Americans' role in the fight for redress and reparations in the 1980s. And sort of our guiding questions for this exhibit was, um, you know, how did the redress experience impact people's identities? And then also, you know, this year and actually this month is the 40th anniversary of the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians or CWRIC hearings that happened in Chicago. Um, it's the 40th anniversary. And so on this anniversary, reflecting on um, the redress movement, what can we learn from that story about other movements for reparations and social justice today? So kind of maintaining that link to other communities and other issues. Um, very similar to Uprooted, you know, we had similar classroom constraints for time, um, also wanted it to be as seamless and easy to use as possible. I think with this particular history, because it is very specific um, and not related to World War II incarceration as directly, um, we're imagining it might be used more often within a college context, um, maybe within a civil liberties class or an Asian American studies um, classroom as well. Um, same considerations for making sure it's functional across devices and thinking about uh, time and participation. Um, when we were thinking about format for this one, we came back to those three options that we had come up with for Uprooted. Um, I think for the redress story, it seemed to not really fit that same multi-generational family focus that worked really well for Uprooted. Um, but when we were thinking back onto the oral history medley, it seemed to be a better fit for that since you know there are multiple perspectives on the movement as, as opposed to having one particular narrator throughout. Um, so we ended up taking this approach where um, we featured multiple voices and a combination of photos, text, um, archival elements, et cetera, um, to provide a bigger overarching history view. Um, so mapping out the story, I spent a ton of time digging through the archives at JASC and um, JCL Chicago's office. Um, there were a lot of personal documents, um, letters, newsletters um, that were really helpful in piecing together the story. Um, I also wanted to uh, shout out the Northeastern Illinois University archives because um, they recently made all of the videos and transcripts from the CWRIC hearings available on their digital commons website. And that was absolutely essential to doing this work, uh, being able to actually watch um, those testimonies and read the transcripts. Um, they're a really powerful set of um, videos and I encourage anybody who's interested in redress history, especially local redress history to check them out. Um, so as you know, I did a lot of research and reading. Um, I sort of came up with five chapters that would um, span, you know, the early, the earliest interest and movement for redress and reparations, all the way up to um, the Chicago Japanese American community's role in racial uh, racial justice and reparations movements today. Um, so with this, I really wanted to be able to tell that larger redress story, but localize it to Chicago, um, because that was, um, you know, the purpose of the grant to uh, really highlight Chicago voices and the Midwest perspective on this history. Um, so that next step was um, selecting speakers. Um, you know, 
one caveat is that you know many many people were involved in the national movement for redress, um, but I specifically focused on Chicago Voices for the purposes of this exhibit. And secondly, you know, a lot of the people that I hoped to interview have um, unfortunately passed away. So um, I went with people who were um, still in town and available and willing to speak. Um, one of those main voices um, is Bill Yoshino, who's on the left. Um, he was the Midwest director. Um, of the JCL during the redress years and for many decades afterwards. And he was very crucial in this um, formation of the exhibit, you know, in speaking to the larger um, campaign strategy for redress um, in the Midwest and how it was executed. Um, Ross Hirano was another voice featured. Um, he was involved in JCL Chicago, and he was also very active in Chicago and Illinois politics. Um, I think he really did a good job speaking to some of the lobbying that was necessary, as well as um, interracial coalition building efforts um, that were really necessary for getting uh, general buy-in uh, from the public for redress and reparations. Um, another voice that um, is featured is Mary Sampson. Um, she's a member of the NCJAR Chicago chapter. This was another organization that uh, grew in addition to JCL Chicago that was advocating for redress. Um, NCJAR actually took more of a judicial approach. So they filed a class action lawsuit as opposed to pushing for, for redress legislation. Um, and so Mary really speaks to um, the motivations for that lawsuit. And then finally, um, there are a couple other voices featured. Um, I know I said that not all of the people I wanted to interview um, were alive, but luckily um, the work of other oral historians and historians really helped um, in this process. So Chie Tomihiro um, is one of those people. She was the chairperson of the Chicago JCL chapters redress committee. She was also a former JCL Chicago president who really led the witness recruitment process and spoke very um, directly to the hearings experience. Um, so I was able to find um, an oral history with her through Densho, which is an online repository of archival material around Japanese American history. And so um, I was able to feature her voice, even though she has passed away. Um, and then the last two voices that are featured are Jane Kaihatsu, who was the JCL chapter president during the redress movement years. Um, she, re she really spoke to the impact of the movement on the Japanese American community's ability to kind of share and educate the larger public about incarceration. Um, and then finally, Lisa Doy, who is the current JCL Chicago president. And Lisa spoke a lot to how uh, the community today is making connections between um, World War II incarceration history and broader patterns of racial injustice. Um, and also about the community's role in current uh, modern day reparations efforts for other communities. Um, you know, here's just some shots from connecting the video interviews. Uh, similarly to Uprooted, used a green screen and had people speak directly into the camera. So it felt very conversational um, and um, sort of engaging and interactive. And then also similar to Uprooted, I think that combination of personal photos and historical photos really helped tell that local history and make it feel more personal. Uh, so one thing I really wanted to highlight on the left is um, a screenshot from a video of one of, I believe, the earliest Chicago pilgrimages to the former sites of Jerome and Rohr incarceration camps. And I was able to take this screenshot um, from some footage uh, that Ross donated to the Southside Home Movie Project in Chicago. Um, he had a lot of extra rolls of uh, film reels in his house. One of them was of this pilgrimage. And so, um, you know, part of the reckoning story talks about the role that pilgrimages played in really activating Sansei um, around uh, redress and also educating them about the camp experience for the first time. And so I think having um, an actual photo of the Chicago community on a pilgrimage um, really just makes that come to life in a new way. Um, and then on the right is a photo that you often see in um, books and articles around redress. Um, it's a historic photo of JCL redress committee members meeting with four Japanese American legislators in Congress. Um, the personal photos were also irreplaceable in this exhibit as well. We had some great donations from Jane Kaihatsu and Mary Sampson that give you an inside look at some of the process, the not so glamorous process of um, lobbying and let, you know pushing for legislation. So on the left, you see uh, a meeting in the JCL Chicago office. You see a younger Bill Yoshino with a map of the Midwest behind him, and they're discussing things over cans of 
Bud Light and old style, you know, with piles of letters on their desk. Um, and on the right, you see a photo of NC Jar members um, folding newsletters in somebody's basement. And the NC Jar newsletter was a main way that the organization communicated with their their members. And so this is a nice kind of sneak peek behind the scenes look at how that um, how that happened. Um, another um, aspect of this. Um, process I wanted to highlight is just how many photos that we were able to unearth from film negatives and contact sheets uh, that had not previously been digitized. Um, so one in particular I think is really powerful is this photo on the left of um, some Japanese Americans in Chicago practicing their testimonies for the formal CWRIC hearings um, recorded on videotape for them to watch back and give feedback on. And um, something we learned through this process of, you know, digitizing these photos is that the actual videotapes of the practices were, um, were held by JCL Chicago. So they have a whole stack of VHSs from those practice workshops that were in the process of getting digitized. Um, so that's an outcome of this project. Um, on the right, you see um, JCL Chicago members playing back some of those tapes reviewing them and giving notes to the participants. Um, so this also gives you a window into the process uh, that went into the witness hearings that you might see in the Northeastern University, um, Northeastern Illinois University archives. Um, I think these photos that were from some contact sheets I found are extremely powerful. They're from JCL Chicago. And, you know, you, you do see these people in the videos from the hearings, but I think because these photos are in such uh, so clear and so close up, it really conveys some of the emotional aspects of that that day. And um, I think that they're just really gems that we were able to find and, um, you know, hopefully will become part of larger archival collections moving forward since this is pretty recent history. Finally, another example of some um, photos we were able to unearth were from the JSC archives. And this is um, from a ceremony at Hewa Terrace, which is a senior living facility in Chicago, uh, where Issei or first generation Japanese American immigrants were receiving their first redress checks. Um, so they're all sitting in, a, I think, in the lobby and um, film camera crews were there uh, for that distribution. Um, for Reckoning, we also got to work with Corey again to develop a visual identity. Um, I think that this was a particularly challenging um, task for her because the redress story is something that is both very technical, you know, it deals with legislation and lobbying and um, paperwork, and it's also very abstract. You know, there are um, a lot of themes like catharsis or healing or shame that are a little hard to capture in photos. Um, and those were themes that we really wanted to come across um, in the visuals. And so she very expertly came up with this metaphor um, using color. And so the orb that you see in these various illustrations represents the Japanese American incarceration story. Um, so if you look at the top uh, right illustration, the um, Nisei parents are trying to sort of hide away that history in a chest. And in the next panel on the right, you see the Sansei kids discovering it for the first time and learning about that history. Um, on the bottom left, you see that the logos for the three different organizations that were leading redress movements with little flames um, of the orb kind of representing how people became activated around this history. Um, and then finally, on the right, you see um, Corey's representation of the CWRIC hearings in Chicago, where a woman is sort of releasing her story for the first time. And you see members of the audience with their own orbs um, representing that they also have their own stories and that they're resonating with her. Um, here's some other examples of how Corey extended that metaphor um, from the process of awakening and learning the story for the first time um, to coalition building with other people and learning uh, that other people are also interested in um, creating a movement around redress. Um, the act of releasing a story with those plumes of smoke coming out from that woman at the podium. Um, kind of working together to push for legislation. And then on the bottom right, seeing the Japanese American redress movement as one of many different movements for racial justice. Um, for Reckoning, we also wanted to include educational elements. 
Um, just a note that these elements are actually still in process right now. We're, we're finalizing them. So um, in the demo link, you know, not all of the supplemental readings and viewings are available, but it's something we're working on. Um, we have a very similar feature to Uprooted where um, there are different key terms that you can click on and get a larger context. And oftentimes we'll link out to um, a longer explanation on uh, the Den Show Encyclopedia, which is uh, an incredible resource um, that gives a lot more historical context about um, Japanese American history. Uh, so putting it all together, here's a, another demo of how reckoning works. Um, I think Emma's also going to drop this link in the chat. Um, so similar to Uprooted, there's a little bit of a scrolling experience that helps introduce um, the incarceration, the Civil Liberties Act, and um, movements today. And then when you click begin, um, it's also a chapterized experience. And if you just stay on that first illustration at the top, you'll see that um, Corey actually in integrated movement into the illustration. So there are looping videos and there's motion. So you can kind of see how that orb is um, reacting or, or interacting with the other people in the shot. Um, if you scroll down, um, we can demo how the key terms work. So let's say you're interested in learning about the 442nd, you can click on it and the definition will come up. Um, and then similarly to Up to Rooted, you get to hear from different speakers throughout. So if you click here from Ross Hirano, um, you know, he will- My first reaction something. was, wow. Now I understand why I have a picture of me as a baby in front of a tar paper shack. Now I understand about the scars. So I'll let you all peruse um, that more in depth. Uh, but just know that this is still a demo site, so not everything is finalized. Even the text isn't completely finalized at this point. Um, but it'll give you a sense of how we try to weave in those different elements, the visuals, photos, and video um, into this experience. Cool. Um, so I think um, now I might pass it off to Emma, who's going to talk a little bit more about legislation around teaching Asian American history in Illinois um, that actually is very recent and happened this past summer. Thank you, Kat. I have to say, uh, despite having been privy to this project's development over the past uh, 11 months or so since I started working at JASC, of course, the project started years, years before that. Um, it's still so wonderful to see Uprooted and Reckoning in their finished or nearly finished forms. Uh, but now we're getting short on time. And to cap things off, I'm going to highlight a very recent development. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get the right links into the right places for you. Um, a development in Illinois that is especially relevant to Kat's amazing work. For those of you outside of Illinois or perhaps less connected to the Asian American community in our state, you may not know that just this summer a truly remarkable thing happened and uh, the Teaching Equitable American History or TEACH Act, HB 376, was introduced this year, 2021, in January. It passed both houses of the Illinois legislature in May and it was signed into law on July 9th. This major success was due in large part to the efforts of a group called Asian Americans Advancing Justice Chicago and a broad coalition of organizations that came together to rally support for the bill. JASC, CJAHS, and the Japanese American Citizens League Chicago chapter were among the many members of that coalition. Next slide, please. So what does the TEACH Act do? And this act amends the Illinois school code to require that a unit on Asian American history be taught in all public elementary and high schools across the state. It specifies that this must include the history of Asian Americans in Illinois and the Midwest. The stated intent of the new requirement is that the studying of this material shall constitute an affirmation by students of their commitment to respect the dignity of all races and peoples and to forever eschew every form of discrimination in their lives and careers. The TEACH Act comes into effect during the 2022-2023 school year, and this means that 
teachers, many of whom were never taught this history themselves, will need to very rapidly acquire appropriate tools and resources to use in the classroom. To some extent, they can turn to high quality national resources, such as the lesson plans available from PBS based on their Asian Americans documentary series, um, or from other Japanese American or Asian American national level organizations. However, in order to teach about Asian American history as it has played out in Illinois and the Midwest, they will need resources like Uprooted and Reckoning, not just from the Japanese American community, but also from the many other Asian American communities that call Illinois home. And I think you'll agree with me that as Kat has demonstrated, it takes a tremendous amount of time and effort to create these types of resources, but the need for them has never been greater, especially in Illinois with this new legislation. And you can see from this slide, uh, we have many, many, many people and organizations to thank for their contributions to this project. And apologies to anyone that I've missed. I'm fairly new to the project myself uh, and I missed out on the first two years of its development. So I do apologize if your name should be on here and it isn't. And I should also thank Kimiko Mar and Carolyn Kimura who have been helping us today um, on behalf of Tadaima to, to run kind of behind the scenes for us to keep things running smoothly. So we don't have a huge amount of time left and I don't believe I've seen any questions come through yet on the chat. If you do have questions for us, you can go right ahead and type those into the chat box on YouTube. I know that I was having a little bit of difficulty earlier with posting, so I had to hand off the links that I was trying to post to someone else to get them up there. So I hope that's not happening to our audience. But Kat, while we wait to see if anyone does have questions for you. Oh, here we go. We do have a question from Kelly Nagasawa. No relation, I suppose. <laughs> what was the most challenging part about each project? Ooh, good question, Kelly. That's my sister. Um, I think for Uprooted, one of the challenging parts was um, the fact that it is a multi-generational story. And so, you know, we're trying to capture not just the stories of the Nisei or Sansei, but also Yonsei and Gosei and subsequent um, generations. And I think that it was, you know, challenging and inspiring to be able to try to weave all those themes together. And, you know, obviously when you walk into a project like this, you don't know what the underlying themes are. You don't know what you're going to find and pull out in the story. So you have to sort of take a leap of faith in working with the families that uh, different things will come through and uh, be translated into this story. So I think just trying to make sure that those themes were consistent and um, woven through is challenging. I think for um, Reckoning, one of the challenges actually was because it was such recent history, a lot of the ar archival materials weren't actually readily available in different institutions that you might normally go to, um, like libraries and museums. Um, a lot of the archival material that I ended up finding was in people's basements. It was, you know, boxes of papers that their mom had um, saved and, you know, the kids hadn't thrown away yet. And so um, kind of going through that almost like a treasure hunt process of trying to go into personal archives and dig through things that hadn't really been cataloged yet was um, time consuming, but also really rewarding as well. And we should add that in a few cases, some of those folks were ready to relinquish some of those materials and, mm -hmm. um, and have them transferred into an archives like like our JSC Legacy Center, where they can be cataloged and, and made accessible. But for some families, they, they weren't that we're ready yet, that these are very personally important materials. And um, I know my institution deeply respects that, that we don't, we don't push for people to give us things, but when they're ready, we are here and happy to make them accessible to researchers everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, I see another question here about the Japanese Latin American experience and whether that is represented in these projects. No, so that experience um, is a super important part of um, learning about Japanese American incarceration history. Um, unfortunately, it isn't a focus of either of the exhibits. Um, although, you know, in doing a lot of research, I did learn a lot more about Japanese Latin Americans um, being incarcerated at Crystal City, which was that the camp that Kazuo's family was 
um, detained at. And so um, in some of his oral history interview, he talks about being alongside Japanese Peruvians in that camp and people from other backgrounds, including German, uh, German Americans and um, or Germans and Italians. Um, so there are parts of it that kind of overlap, but um, it doesn't go into deep depth around it. Um, one other thing I learned during my research is that um, one of the organizations that isn't you know, very deeply profiled in Reckoning, it's called um, NCRR, National Coalition for Redress and Reparations. Um, they did a lot of work around um, working with the Japanese Latin American community to push for um, redress for, for them because that wasn't involved so that wasn't included in the 1988 Civil Liberties Act. Um, so that's definitely something that I'm very interested in seeing more um, pieces go deeper into. And I'm personally very curious about. And while we give folks a few minutes more, we're coming up on the hour, but uh, we are prepared to stay on. So if you are if you have questions and you're holding back because you think we're coming to the end of time, please feel free to, to get your questions in. Um, but Kat, I was wondering if you have thoughts about what future projects might be in store for you or that you hope JASC or another J organization might pursue? Yeah, um, I think in doing the research for Reckoning, I just kept thinking to myself how incredible of a feature film it would be to do um, a film about that whole redress process. There's just so much, um, you know, drama to it. There's a lot of uh, behind the scenes work that happened uh, with political lobbying. Um, there's a lot of community organizing on a grassroots level. So I would love to see a fictional film be made about redress. Um, I don't know if I would necessarily be the one directing it, but I would support them in any way possible. Um, in addition to that, I do think that uh, what the other person, I'm, I'm not sure what his name is, um, B. Nakashima said about the Japanese Latin American experience is something I also think is incredibly important to tell, especially given that a lot of the survivors of those uh, camps are now probably in their late 80s and 90s, um, now more than ever is the right time to be capturing those histories. And um, as somebody who, you know, speaks some Spanish, I would also be very interested in um, kind of getting to know some of the Japanese uh, communities in both Peru and Brazil that kind of came up as part of the Japanese diaspora, um, not just about their incarceration during World War II, but just about um, that culture and the, the history of those specific places. I think I hear a future grant proposal <laughs> in that potential project. Um, well, we are we are at the end of our time, and I don't see any last questions coming in. So I think we'll bring it to a close. And thank you, Kat, yeah, for giving you. us a, a real peek at the behind the scenes of how you created these sites. But also, this is for folks who don't realize this is the first public unveiling of both of these sites. So we really are so excited to have shared them with you. Um, of course, the teachers got to see an earlier draft version of, of Uprooted, but it, Uprooted has actually seen several important changes since then as well. So, um, mm -hmm. so you were the first to see it, and now you have the links to go to both sites, and you can explore on your own. Um, yeah, and I would just say, if any of you know um, US history teachers, um, please spread the word to them. Um, a lot of our fall and winter are going to be focused on really getting these out and in classrooms. So um, that is our biggest goal is if it actually gets used um, by students and in front of students. So um, thank you all for your time and yeah. Yeah, so thank you on behalf of the JASC Legacy Center and Tadaima 2021 and Journey Chicago, which is a project of the Chicago Cultural Center. Thank you for joining us tonight. Awesome, bye.